Hey guys, I am presently in my mom's moose room. As you can see behind me, there is a moose over my shoulder. Um, and as you can see, for some reason, don't know why, this thing records in mirror. Don't, don't ask me why. That's what Macintosh wanted to do. I want to talk briefly, uh, this is for Facebook, I want to talk briefly about this. I've had a few people ask me about it. I, I don't have very many friends on Facebook, but I've had two people ask about it. You know who you are. Uh, I want to know what I plan to do with this. I, I mentioned briefly that I, I want to make this into something. It's a project. This, first of all, is a M1889 uh, Danish Krag Jorgensen. It's the original Krag, if you really want to get down to it. Uh, but uh, I'm going to do something that's very unlike me with this barreled action. I'm going to make a sporter. Now, I haven't taken a good picture of it yet, but I have a crag sporter already. Uh, it's an American crag. The, so far, the only picture I've put up is an 18, of the 1898 crag that I bought a couple months ago over in Oregon for a steal. Um, and that one I really like. I actually like it as a sporter. Uh, it really lends itself to that. Uh, it, it just feels right. Uh, there's a lot of military rifles that I've had that they're sporterized and it just feels wrong. But I guess there's something about an American rifle that really lends itself to being sporterized. So uh, that's where this comes in. I was inspired by my, uh, my 1898 model Krag, the U.S. Krag in 3040, and I've been seeing a lot of barreled actions of the 1889 Krag, and I don't know why there, there's so many of them out there. Um, most of them are these carbine cut um, 1920s conversions. This one was, the everything is matching. It was built in 1916, um, but yeah, for some reason, there, there are all these uh, carbine uh, setups, and I'm guessing they're leftovers from the arsenal in Copenhagen. Uh, this one's wa this one wasn't built in Copenhagen, though. No. This is uh, Herens Toihus, which I don't know where that is, but some were made in Copenhagen, some were made in this particular arsenal, which is weird that Denmark would have two arsenals being such a small country. I think they're like the size of uh, New York State. But that's beside the point. So the plan is, as you can see, there's no front sight, no rear sight or anything. The plan is to put a peep sight, like I have for my uh, my US Krag, either on the receiver or on the bolt right here. There's some low profile peep sights that I can get a hold of that I can put on there. And temporarily, I'm going to put on a bolt on front sight that's actually designed for the Mosin Nagant, but uh, bore diameter, outside diameter is the same for both at, at this cutoff point. So uh, that way I can experiment with it, but the big thing, of course, people are probably wondering is, well, where's the stock? Um, that's going to be another trick, is building a stock for it. You see, they're nearly impossible to find. In fact, surplus parts for these are nearly impossible to find. So I'm hoping nothing goes wrong on it because I'm not going to find them. Uh, not likely, seeing as it's gotten to this time and it looks like everything on here works just like it should and is all matching. I'm serious. Like, every part is matching. and I'll show you functionality in a second. But, yeah, uh, I plan on buying a barrel blank. Those usually cost about $45. It's basically a block of wood that's in, like, a very basic, uh, or not barrel blank, uh, stock blank. It's a very basic stock shape. It's like a weird uh, trapezoid. Uh, and then you can carve out. Uh, some people do it by hand. That's what I'm going to try and do. Uh, $45. I'm not going to cry over it if I do a poor job. I can, later on down the line, get a much nicer... Uh, stock made for it by a professional, but I just kind of want to get this this thing shooting. Um, another thing is the ammunition is just 
impossible to find. It's 8 by 5 8 rimmed. Uh, the last person to manufacture it on a regular basis was Norma, and they stopped in the 60s. Uh, this just wasn't a popular rifle. Uh, probably because there weren't so many made, and it was really, other than some rolling blocks from the 1880s, this was it for 8x5.8 rimmed. And the rolling blocks were black powder proofed. This was smokeless proofed. So most of the stuff that you would find from back then was like downloaded just in case you were going to shoot in a rolling block. Or specially marked for Danish crags. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I think I'm going to put this on YouTube. But, so, that, that, that's the story for the ammunition. The, so it's not going to be available. Not entirely unavailable, but there's some brass out there from a company called Bertram. Uh, I don't expect to have any luck with it from all the stuff I've been hearing. It's really old manufacturer, and it tends to be pretty weak ammunition, or uh, brass. Most people I've, I've read it tears. So... My plan, and this is not, I'm not actually going to do it with steel cased rounds. This is a steel cased round of 7.62x54 rimmed. Uh, everything I've been reading, the, uh, the case body is basically the same size. Uh, case length is a little bit shorter, 4 millimeters. All the pictures that I've been seeing show these at, you know, not not exactly looking right. They look like they have a really short neck, but, you know, I can deal with that. I've got experience reloading, and it doesn't seem like it's going to be a problem, uh, especially from all the stuff I've been reading and the people saying that it functions just fine. Uh, so let's get down to functionality on this. Oh, by the way, it's going to be really expensive initially to start reloading for this. Uh, this project's probably going to take a while. Um, if you're wondering, I paid $150 for this setup. So, you know, I didn't pay a whole bunch. Uh, I mean, these aren't common. They're common enough to be $150, and most people don't want to deal with it because the ammunition is impossible to find. But if you know me well enough, you know I love to play with this stuff. <laughs> so, uh, first thing that you'll notice, if you've seen Crags before... You know, this is the magazine, this box on the side. Uh, it feeds around through the bottom. It's nice having this actually open so people can see it. It feeds around the bottom and over to the side. And if I open the bolt, it comes out here. And I don't have any loose ammunition. In fact, I can use 7.62x54, but not exactly safe. Mostly because I can't do things with the safety. Uh, the safety functions and everything, but I, I just don't feel safe doing that. Especially in my mom's house. Not cool. So, yeah, it, it feeds out here and it actually loads from the side. And, yeah, it, it's fairly simple. It's called a capsule magazine, but here's the weird thing. Watch this. Most crags will hinge down. This crag opens out that now that is weird now I mean there's been some weird things out there like the type 11 machine gun and you know the Craig Jorgensen I think in general is just a weird design that uh, really I, I don't know if it was just like somebody trying to work around like a patent or what but really in the early days of repeating rifles, your options were a Kropotschek tube magazine, the Lee magazine, which is a detachable box magazine. If you have an SMLE, you know what I'm talking about. Or the Mauser single stack or double stack box magazine. And if you didn't want to pay for any of those, I don't know how much the patents cost. There's always Crag. Um, but the big problem with Crag is you had to load rounds loose in here. I'll, I'll at least put it in the magazine. But you take a round, there's no stripper clips or anything, as you can see. And in this case, it's a little fiddly. Uh, with other crags, you just you can drop them in loose. This one, you, you still drop it in loose, but you have to go point first and then drop. 
So you saw it fall out there. So my screensaver popped up for some reason. It's kind of a weird thing for Mac to do. So yeah, it, it does that, which is, you know, really, I, I find it interesting. I love when there's weird stuff going on with a gun. Um, so yeah, that's the magazine. Uh, this, you'll see it hinge out. That thing, see it hinging while I move? That's the follower. That's what pushes the bullets kind of in a, a snail uh, shape around to the other side, which is kind of cool, if you ask me. Um, so another thing is back in 1889, for about 20 years, these guns didn't have a safety. The, the Danish ones, at least. So, close the bolt, turn it. They also, these all had straight bolts, except for the uh, cavalry and, I believe, the artillery carbines. Infantry, everything had a straight bolt. So, uh, cocking piece is kind of strange. Take a look at that. But, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. This is a safety. Now, like I said, for about 21 years, there was no safety on these guns. Well, in 1910, there was a patent. I don't know who did it, but there's a patent for a special safety specifically designed for Danish crags. And what you do is on this little part, you push it in with your thumb. I'm doing it with my forefinger, of course, from one notch to the other. And what it does is it holds the bolt handle in place as well, you can't really see it here. I'm sorry, I'm a bit grainy. You can't see it here, but it blocks the trigger. It's a pretty solid safety, actually. I, mean, I can't, I can't move anything. But it's not the wing safety that you see in later crags, which is a more visual safety. Like you can see the difference right in front of you while you're you're sitting with the uh, the gun. You know aim down range. So I'm going to snap it. But one thing that I think is really dumb, and it may be different when I actually get a stock on this, but this cocking piece, I, I can clearly tell, was designed to mimic hammers. Obviously, it's a striker-fired rifle. So they're like, you know, what if your soldier needs to recock the gun on a... Uh, on, on a dummy or a dead a dud round or maybe a soft primer hit maybe you have a hard primer I don't know so their logic would probably be pulling it back like a hammer but the thing is your re or your your striker spring is just too stiff I'm and I'm really I'm you know I'm you know I'm not the strongest guy but yeah I've I've got some forearms you know, I've got a bit of a Popeye thing going on here. And it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So I actually, and I, I think I can really only successfully do this without a stock on. I have to wrap my finger around this and kind of work it back because it's so stiff. And I've lubricated the crap out of this. When I first got it in the box, this thing was dry as a bone. I mean, just felt rough. So... The, I've, it's lubricated, I promise you. That was a dumb idea. Because you'll notice on later crags, it's designed to grasp with your thumb and forefinger to wrap around the cocking piece. This just doesn't work. It's dumb. So, But otherwise, it functions just like a crag should. It's super smooth, just like all crags. Uh, it has one big thing that a lot of people will tell you. Crags have one locking lug. No, they have two. American crags maybe have one, but it depends on the kind you have. The early crags, 1892s and 1896s, had one locking lug, and even then, that's not really true. So, here's, here's what it is. If I take off this bolt, I know this is a long video, whatever, you have a forward locking lug. And a lot of people think, okay, that's the only locking lug. 
No, that's not. You actually have a second locking lug, which is this. Now if I turn this, move this over, this is the extractor, which is freaking huge. But this guide rib, which has my serial number on it, but this guide rib actually acts as a second locking lug. Uh, now on the early crags, and you see it on some later crags too, mine in particular, I don't know if somebody like filed down the very tip of this, but it, I mean it's microns difference. But on American crags, they filed this this down slightly so it wasn't a locking lug anymore. It was more like a safety lug. Uh, in the Norwegian crags and the Danish crags, the squared part of the bolt right there, that's the, uh, that's the safety lug. But in the American crags, that was the safety lug. Now, in some cases, especially with the early crags, that's filed down. And a lot of people say it's to avoid the patent that Mauser had for two opposing locking lugs. That makes no sense because these are two unopposed locking lugs. That doesn't make sense. And in fact, there is no patent about a guide rib locking lug at all. In fact, you know, in most cases, a gun like the Mosin Nagant, the Carcano, um, the uh, Remington Lees, and then the Lee Enfield later on, Lee Metford actually at the time, had these types of locking lugs. So really the Americans had no excuse doing that. Uh, the explanation really isn't clear. So if I can, this, oh, I'm telling you, this spring is stiff. It's, this is my youngest crag too, that's the funny thing. But it's, you know, it's only, this is only 99 years old. Think about that. This is only 99 years old. I just said that. So, yeah, th so it, it, what it does is it locks against this face on the receiver. It's kind of hard to see. But it locks on that face on the receiver. So, really, these are pretty stiff bolts. Um, Norwegian Crag, just like this, you can even see the wear on there from where the bolt bears against that surface on my US crag same thing so really there's no reason to think that that's not operating as a locking lug so yeah uh, another thing that's very interesting is this one has a two-stage trigger which means you have a first easy pull and a second pull I'm gonna put this down uh, and then the American Crag has a two-stage trigger. Norwegian Crag has a single-stage trigger. I don't know why that is. Honestly, so far, the best feeling trigger is on the Norwegian Crag. Uh, no matter what, that thing surprises me every time I pull the trigger. And the U.S. Crag is a bit gritty. Uh, however, so far, my U.S. Crag is actually my best shooting rifle. I think it's pretty, uh, pretty sweet for... That one was made in 1904, I think. Late 1903, early 1904. Uh, a lot of people think that these rifles were made, they stopped making them in 1903. They actually manufactured them until 1904 because they still had a contract through Springfield that lasted until a certain serial number. I can't remember what it was. So it was pretty much like the government was obligated to pay Springfield to manufacture these rifles. And so they continued. So this is like the end run uh, Craig Jorgensen rifle uh, out of Springfield. Real nice rifle. Barrel is amazing. I just can't believe it sometimes. And yeah, it's like beautiful. Like inch grouping. Uh, and I think that's more me than the rifle. I think that rifle would shoot way better than I can. Um, it's a CMP target conversion. So, but that's all besides. So what I want to do with this Danish crag is turn it into a sporter. And honestly, if you sat with me through this entire video, 
and tolerated me gabbing on about all this stuff, well, kudos to you, because I don't expect anyone to stick with it at all. I think I'm done talking. Good night, everybody.